Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Today, we're here at the Cranbrook Institute of Science, where we'll visit both the planetarium and to the left, the observatory. We'll be visiting both of these interesting venues during this program. So let's head inside. We're here outside the planetarium, and I'd like to introduce our special guest for this episode, Jan Fjolko. Jan, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great to join everyone. Looking forward to showing you around. Great. Well, why don't we head inside? Jan, the planetarium has had a number of upgrades uh, since it was built back in 1955. Uh, what was here originally? Yes, back then we had what was called a Spitz 512 planetarium projector, which uh, if any of you visited a planetarium, you may recall that it's often a large ball in the center of the room with a light bulb inside. That ball has all the holes on the outside that uh, mimic where the stars would be located. The ball um, is illuminated by the bulb inside, and each of those little holes projects an image of the star up onto the dome in the exact position that it would be in the sky. In addition to that, there would also be something called a planet cage, where all the planets would be set on little cogs and wheels as part of the projection system, and they would rotate at the same speed that the real planets rotate, but of course on a scaled down version, so that you could actually mimic the transit of the planets across the sky. In addition to that, all the way around, behind these uh, black walls here, there would be a whole series of slide projectors that would produce images on the dome, so you could show planets, the moons, if you wanted to show motion, then you might have several projectors all lined up pointing at the same part of the dome that would go in rapid sequence so that uh, you could actually mimic motion. And then sometimes there was a projector with a mirror. The mirror would turn and it would give the illusion of something moving through the sky, such as a spacecraft, for example. Unfortunately, I never got to work with the uh, Spitz 512. Um, I came and started in 1998 just as the uh, planetarium was going to be converted from the Spitz 512. So I got to see it a little bit, but I uh, never gave any shows with that. But I worked in a planetarium in Florida for nine years that had a Zeiss M1015 projector, which had the same concept, where it was mechanical. You had buttons and dials that you advance on the console to make the stars move and other special effects. But then in 1999, we did away with that and installed a Digistar 2. So this is a whole new concept of planetarium projector because instead of using a ball with a light bulb inside, now it was actually a cathode ray tube that was being projected up onto the dome. So basically it's a computer screen that allowed motion of the stars. So you could make the stars do anything you like, basically. First time I ever got to see a Digistar, I was just blown away with this whole concept and where you could make all the stars move and suddenly you were looking at a galaxy right on the dome where all those stars congealed to make one galaxy, for example. So that was cool. So when we got the D2 here, it was a great upgrade. The stars did have a slight greenish tinge to them, so there was no color, but you know, when you look at it, it kind of pretty much looked white. The green was just very, very slight. But then over the years, um, we upgraded from that D2 to D3. That was a big step up because now you had color for stars, so Betelgeuse really did look this uh, orangey red color rather than the white greenish tinge that it did before. And uh, there were a whole bunch of other upgrades that came with the, the D3. So the D2 just had a single box right in the center with one actual uh, lens projecting up onto the dome. So you were a bit limited, you could do stars, but then if you wanted to do something else, like we used to do laser shows, we used to feature 3D 
objects like dinosaurs, say, or a person, but they can only be in wire cage format. There was no substance to them. But with the D3, when that came in, it ended up being two projectors that uh, are synced to work in unison. Then you could have proper renditions of objects. So it was a big step up. And then now we come up to the present time where just in the past few months we've got the D6. So on the outside this pretty much looks the same, but the changes have uh, mostly been on the software side where suddenly we have all these other features that are just mind-blowing what this system can do. So I want to take you back and show you the console so you can see something of what we actually do to operate it. Great. Yeah, let's take a look back behind the console here and show our visitors uh, some of the interesting things that can be done with this system. Now, Jan, I also understand that the D6 can do uh, dome casting, uh, where we can uh, broadcast from other mm -hmm. planetariums. Uh, what about that? To me, that's as groundbreaking as adaptive optics for telescopes that you can actually do this because what it enables someone to do is to actually take control of planetaria around the world from a laptop computer with an internet connection and actually do a live presentation that can be featured not just in the place where they're at, but around all the planetaria that are actually tuned in. And then there's a little chat window that uh, visitors in those other planetaria can ask questions of the presenter. So it's almost like everyone's in that room, except they could be spaced across the globe. That sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Uh, let's take a few minutes and uh, show our viewers just uh, what this D6 can do. Well, there's two main windows that you see here, two main computers. So each one has similar features, like this first uh, screen here has a sequence of buttons on it. These are the buttons that one would mostly use to do a presentation. So you have renditions or buttons here for, say, sunset. You have buttons for constellations. You have buttons for asterisms. You have buttons for music. So you can choose the music that you'd like to have playing. But then those same buttons are also on this screen as well. But uh, this screen here has all the other features as well as these buttons. So these would be like the standard ones that most of us go to. But then on this window, we can all have, and we being me and other staff members, our own little cue files where we can actually choose whatever objects we want to talk about and put those in that cue file so that as we have an audience in the planetarium, we can quickly go to those objects and talk about them as, as you know, we uh, are going through everything. So there's a nice flow to it. We don't have to say, oh, hold on while I find the image of Jupiter that I like to see. Here, I got it in my queue file. I can just go right to it. And another great feature that I absolutely love with the Digistar, and especially these later versions, is that um, there's also a cloud content. That's where other planetaria that have Digistar systems they create wonderful renditions, say, of the sun or flying through Saturn's rings. They can actually put that on the cloud, and we and other planetaria can look through those and see if there's one that we really like. And if we do, then we can download it here and incorporate it in our own presentation. So that's another wonderful feature of the Digistar that I absolutely love. And then over here, we have another computer that controls the lights. So by pushing these buttons, I can make the lights change color. I can make them go off. I can bring them on. So you can almost have your own show with just the lighting system alone. There's about 1,400 LEDs that go right away around this uh, room. So uh, you can pretty much go through any color you like. And then, as well, we have different slides here. So in the past, like I mentioned, with the, um, the spits, we used to have all sequence of slide projectors around the room. Those are gone. Here, we can actually have slides built into the projection system that we can bring up on the dome, as well as these other great features that D6 offers. It uh, looks like a, a wonderful system, and it probably is very entertaining for our for the guests to come here to Cranbrook to see a show. Now, uh, I know that there are weekend programs for the general public, mm -hmm. 
but uh, during the week it's uh, mostly for school groups. Uh, if you could fill in our visitors about that just a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Uh, school groups are uh, definitely the, the norm here during the week. And in addition to those live shows where we talk about the sky, we also have a whole series of pre-recorded shows, some of which we do show at the weekend to public, but which school groups can actually choose. So if a teacher calls up and say, we'd like a, a show on the solar system, then we can find a show on the solar system and present that to the class so we can tailor what the planetarium shows to what the teacher's needs are. In addition to those, we also have scouts as well. We have scout overnights at the museum, part of which, if they wish, they can have their own planetarium show. Some actually like a star show, but many like a music show. If you remember the laser light shows of the past, well, those are gone. They're replaced by all dome video, but it's all done to music, so the kids really get into it. It's an absolutely wonderful thing, something I personally really enjoy, having a room full of kids all shouting and jumping and really enjoying themselves as part of the presentation that's just for them. Sounds like some interesting shows that uh, we can cover the, uh, the gamut of whatever teachers or scouting or other types of groups would want to have here in the planetarium. Now in a, just a few minutes we're going to be heading up to the, uh, to the observatory uh, to take a look at uh, three different telescopes that uh, make up that wonderful facility. If you uh, have any questions, uh, you can send us an email. The email address is down at the bottom of your screen, as always. And coming up next is Term of the Month. Stephen? The Term of the Month is Meteor Crater. This meteorite comes from Meteor Crater, which is in Arizona, not far from the Grand Canyon. If you're in the area, I, it's highly worth a visit. Uh, this meteor, though, isn't called a meteor crater or meteorite. It is called a Diablo Canyon meteorite. And that's because meteor crater was originally called the Diablo Canyon crater. A, a very large object, object, about 160 feet across, made of iron and nickel, created this crater by smashing into the ground. Now some say that the, the impact would have destroyed, disintegrated the actual object. Uh, others have pointed out that one of the rims is a little bit higher than the other side. Whatever the story really is, people tried mining for the object that struck and made this crater by digging straight down in the middle of the crater and they never found it. And that's the term of the month, Meteor Crater. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back to the program. We're up in the observatory right now to take a look at this very interesting facility. Jan, can you tell us about the, uh, the dome? Yes, indeed. Well, the, uh, the main structure that you see here originates from 1930. And the story goes that the original telescope was in a different part on the campus but uh, suffered a lot from vibration and moisture and other environmental issues. So this observatory was constructed and was kind of the main catalyst for the construction of the Cranbrook Institute of Science. So really this whole building kind of grew up around the fact we wanted an observatory here. So this dome you see up above us now, this is actually a lot newer. This is from 2012. We had a major upgrade uh, at that time where this new telescope equipment was installed, also the new dome as well. The old dome had been here for many years and so was suffering a little bit of uh, age. So we, uh, at the time when the telescopes were upgraded, had the dome upgraded as well. And uh, since this telescope is uh, controlled by computer, we needed to update the dome so it too could be controlled by computer. Interesting. Now, can you tell us about each of the three telescopes that we see mounted on this pier? Yes, well, we actually have three telescopes here. The original telescope sat right here on this pedestal from 1930 right through 2012. So in 2012, this uh, telescope, the old one was removed and this equipment was actually put on top of the original pier, which goes right down through the floor and into the basement. 
So we actually have three different telescopes here. So the main one, the biggest one of all, is a 20-inch plane wave telescope. It's called a CDK, which is short for Corrected Dull Kirkham. Quite a mouthful, really, but uh, it's a great telescope. The concept was invented by Dave Rowe, and uh, the idea is that this telescope has a flat field, which is great for imaging. So there's a main mirror in the back, which is uh, 20 inches across. And to give you some idea of the scale of this thing, this is the cover for that mirror. So it gives you a good sense of just how large this is for the, you know, the size of that mirror. So it's 20 inch. So there's a mirror in the back. There's a mirror up here. So the concept for this telescope is light comes in, hits that 20 inch mirror right at the back, bounces up through this tube, hits this mirror right here on the top, and then it bounces back right through a hole in that main mirror where there's a lens group that further enhances the image and removes some of the distortions that one gets from other kinds of telescope, like the basic Newtonian reflector. So you don't get any coma or any astigmatism. You've got a perfectly flat field, which is great for doing a CCD imaging. So this is a carbon fiber tube, so it's not metal. But this whole scope weighs 140 pounds, so it's still a fair bit of weight. So consequently, we have a whole bunch of weights on the other side of this pedestal that help balance this scope out. So that's the main telescope. It's used for photography. There's a camera right here at the back. This is an Apogee U16M camera, 16 megapixels, so a very, very good camera, very sensitive to light. I get a great deal of pleasure out of using it. And uh, all the images I feature here uh, for visitors when they come to the observatory, although they can't look through that telescope, they can see on that screen what this telescope is capable of. And I found people to be very interested in what this scope can actually achieve. So that's the main telescope. Next one, this another one right up here, this large white telescope. That is a six inch Takahashi refractor. So instead of a mirror, we have a lens at the front here, six inches across. To do our little comparison of size, here's the cover for that telescope. So a little bit smaller, but it is a triple APO telescope. So it's an amazing scope. It gives some great views of the night sky. This is the one that we primarily use for visitors when they come to the observatory. They can actually look through this themselves, see planets, the moon. I also love to put it on deep sky objects as well. And uh, visitors do get a great uh, sense of pleasure out of this. It's uh, an F7.3 telescope. Compare that to F6.8 for this. So it's a pretty uh, good refractor in terms of uh, F ratio. And then last, but by no means least, is this, the smaller telescope. This, give you a sense of scale. <laughs> Here's the lens cover for this. This is a four inch telescope. But what's special about this telescope? It's a Lunt telescope. It's actually a solar telescope. So normally, if you were to look at the sun with a telescope or binoculars, absolutely lethal for your eyes, of course. But this one has a series of hydrogen alpha filters inside that uh, safely allow you to look at the sun without ruining your eyes. And so we use this on what we like to call solar Sundays, where we actually have an afternoon dedicated to solar observing on the first Sunday of the month. So visitors can come up, actually see our nearest star completely safely. Now I understand we you are using a very uh, interesting software package, a program to control the, uh, the telescopes here. If you could uh, tell our visitors just a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. And here it is. This is the main system that we use to actually control the telescope. So the uh, software is called SkyX, and it's connected to the telescope and also to the dome as well. So the idea is that um, this, what you see here, is actually the night sky. This semicircle that you see right here, this green color, that's actually mimicking the opening in the dome. So whatever you see inside that semicircle, 
you can see right where the dome is pointing. But if you wanted to look at something on the other side of the sky, that's okay. The whole dome and telescope are connected, so the dome and the scope will move in unison with each other to point in a different area of the sky. So it really takes a lot of the work out of looking for objects because we can just tell the computer what we want to look at, the scope and the dome will rotate to it. So we have five and six year olds driving this telescope and they get a great kick out of doing just that. So you don't even need to be an astronomer to drive this. This really makes the whole process so much easier and user friendly. So you get more time observing rather than star hopping and trying to find this elusive object in the sky. You mentioned earlier about showing visitors to the observatory some of your images and uh, if we could take a couple of minutes and talk about just uh, a few of them please. Yes, well, all the deep sky images, um, I use the CDK to actually uh, take those photos. And uh, these are just a sample of some of the images I've taken. I think we're going to show some on the screen during our presentation or the program. Yeah, yeah, but um, for example, this one here, um, this is the Seven Sisters or Pleiades. Just a little part of it. Uh, the scope is so powerful that we can't get all the stars in. But you can see some of the nebulosity surrounding some of the stars here. So this isn't actually a single image. This is really 12 images, 150 seconds each, that are put together with a great program that we also have here called Maxim DL5 that we use to actually process the images. Right here is M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. So this I actually took uh, three nights ago in addition to this. So it's showing you the central region and you can see some of the spiral structure of this galaxy. These two objects are so large in our sky, the scope's so powerful that we can't get the entire thing in, but nevertheless it really shows up very, very well. Here we have M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. This was just a single shot that I took when I was kind of new here, teaching myself how to use this equipment. And then we have M33, Galaxy in Triangulum. This is M22, a globular cluster in Sagittarius. And M8, the Lagoon Nebula. And then over on this screen, we have also additional images, some of which I've taken with the CDK. But I also do show some images that I've taken with the Takahashi and also the LUNT. So on cloudy nights, I can show visitors exactly what all of this can do. Well, this is quite a facility, Jan, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to come up here and uh, see all of the, the wonderful equipment that is available for visitors to the Science Institute to take advantage of. Yes. And, uh, come up and see the, the night sky for themselves. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, allowing us to come up here and being our guest and uh, showing us in the planetarium and the observatory. Absolutely, you're very welcome. It's been a great pleasure. I hope you really just come and see us in person. Also, I'd like to uh, thank the Cranbrook Institute of Science for allowing us to be here today. Um, down at the bottom of your screen, you can see our website. You can check it out for more information. And coming up next, as always, is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Stephen? Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for February 2019? The sun rises at 7.46 a.m. to 5.47 a.m. and sets at 5.47 p.m. to 6.21 p.m., so the days are getting longer. Astronomical night is a little over an hour and a half, uh, plus or minus. The moons. The month starts with a new moon on the 4th, the first quarter on the 12th, the full moon on the 19th. That's when NASA can't go back to the moon because it's full, and third quarter on the 26th. Now, in the evening sky, this is on February 28th, um, Mercury is, uh, goes from Capricornus to Pisces over the month, and it sets 
between um, 5.46 p.m. to 7.50 in the morning. So there's an inferior conjunction. It's best at the end of the month. Uh, that's because there's a maximum eastern elongation on the 26th. Uranus goes from Pisces to Aries and sets from 15 minutes after midnight to 10.30 over the month. It's best at the beginning of the month. We're moving toward superior conjunction in just two months in April. Neptune is in Aquarius where it always is. It sets um, at um, 8.25 to really early, 6.44. So it's best at the beginning of the month if you can see it at all. It's best as close after sunset as you can as you can look. You'll need binoculars or something at least to see it and a good sky chart. Now, on February 1st at 6.55 a.m., a, 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 a time chosen so that Mercury is above the horizon at all, um, uh, Mars goes between Pisces and Aries and sets uh, 11.35 to 11.24 p.m. It doesn't move that much because Earth is trying to catch up. It's best at the end of the month, an hour after sunset. Jupiter is in Ophiuchus, rises at 4.20 to uh, 2.50 a.m. and is best at the end of the month, uh, 45 minutes before sunrise. Saturn is in Sagittarius, rises at 6.18 to 4.00. Uh, 42 is best at the end of the month, and again, is best watched just uh, like 45 minutes before sunrise. Pluto is also in Sagittarius. It's not noted here on the, on the image, but it's right there, right near Saturn. Uh, good sky chart for uh, Pluto. It rises at 6.45 in the morning to 5 in the morning, and an hour before sunrise at least, maybe an hour and a half, uh, to get that astronomical night. Now, on the 26th, Mercury is at greatest eastern elongation. And if you look in the inner uh, solar system in the upper left, you draw a line from the Earth to the Sun to Mercury, and it's uh, more or less a right, uh, a right triangle. And that's why it's greatest elongation. It's farthest from the Sun as it appears from us. And that is what's up in the night sky for February 2019. Uh, we don't charge money for this show, but we may tax your brain. Well, it's just a matter of doing the reassembly, okay? Because that's why we had to tell Steve to get exactly 415 in February because he had to make what's up work because he already had the time the show took plus the added time that he took for that segment he did for turn -off. Ahead of time.